All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to today's webinar, Getting Published in Earthquake Spectra and Beyond. Thank you for joining us. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with ERI, before we get started, I just want to say a few words about us. Um, ERI is the leading nonprofit membership organization that's co that connecting professionals across a wide range of disciplines and backgrounds who are working together to advance earthquake resilience, both in the United States and around the globe. And we'd like to welcome you to join us if you're not already a member. Here are some of the things we offer our members, um, the Pulse newsletter that comes twice a month, access to all of the articles in the journal we'll be talking about today, Earthquake Spectra, webinars like these, uh, and many more. So you can go to our website, uh, eri.org backslash join to find out more. And with that, I'm going to introduce today's speakers. Uh, today we have Jack Baker, who's the Associate Dean of Faculty Affairs and a Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Stanford, who's the editor of Earthquake Spectra, and David Wald, a research geophysicist at the U.S. Geological Survey, who's the editor-in-chief. I'm going to hand it over to them, and they're going to tell you all about getting published in Earthquake Spectra. So good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, uh, wherever you are in the world. Um, yeah, so I'm going to kind of uh, get us started here, and, and David will, will chime in with his uh, thoughts uh, to complement mine as, as we move along. So we're, we've got a few thoughts for you to, to get going, but then we're, I think, I'm mostly looking forward to the Q&A session uh, later. So if there are any points along the way that are not clear or, or some other topics that we're not uh, emphasizing here, we'd love to hear your your interests and thoughts, and we'll, we'll take some time later to to have a conversation with you and, and yeah, enter those in the Q&A box, as Elizabeth said. Okay, so um, kind of the topics we're going to highlight today, um, one, just talking about the peer review process in general. Um, so this isn't unique to Earthquake Spectra, um, but um, having a general understanding of what this process looks like, I think is really important for your successfully navigating it. Um, we'll talk a little bit about Earthquake Spectra, specifically uh, logistics. Um, and then also I want to tell you, um, you know, your, your important research is the, is the product of Earthquake Spectra, right? We're, we're just facilitating getting that work out and archived. Um, and we we would like your valuable um, scholarship. And so we want to talk for a little bit about why we think that Earthquake Spectra is a great venue to be taking your scholarship to. So let's uh, move along. So peer review, just generally, um, some of you are probably uh, understand this well, but maybe some of the students or others haven't had a, um, a lot of formal exposure to this. Um, but this process of, of peer reviewing scholarship is really uh, one of the foundational pieces of academic work. It's been a... a um, a process that's been in place for you know centuries and the idea is that um, your research is very specialized and so it wouldn't make sense for um, some sort of permanent staff to be trying to review this research as it comes in for possible publication and so we go to your peers to review it right and and sometimes you're that peer that's reviewing um uh, david and i as, as um managing the journal are in charge of trying to identify who those peers are who can then you know bring their specialist knowledge to evaluate your work um, and by going through this process where you're subjecting your work to the um, review of peers, taking their feedback and, and having to you know, address their feedback um, through revisions uh, in many cases, that um, what I find it when, when I'm the author, it very much improves the quality of my work, getting feedback from um, other uh, experts in the topic. Um, you know, the work is more credible when it's finally published because the readers uh, understand that it's been through some level of scrutiny before it made their way to their eyes. Um, and then the other important part of this process is that we archive all of the publications, right? So each uh, you know few months, a new issue comes out with new papers, but all of the old papers are archived for permanent viewing. And so up on the screen here is a, one of the papers from volume one, issue one from Earthquake Spectra. It's now uh, almost 40 years old. You know, some journals go back, um, you know, even much uh, further than that, but all of those papers are still available. And so when we... Um, you know, as, as the publisher, we, we you know, or, as, or as the, the leaders of the journal, we want to make sure that the work is merits uh, this permanent archiving. Um, but you as an author know that once you put your work through this process, it's going to be available to the community in perpetuity. So that's also quite valuable. So what does this process look like? Right? So I, I remember submitting my first paper and like, I got this paper. Um, you know, back then, the system was a little bit different. Uh, now you, you go to a website, you upload your paper and some information, and then it if everything goes quiet for a while. Um, so what's going on behind the scenes that, that we're dealing with uh, looks something like this. So we we kind of head down the column first. We the, That paper goes through the website and it makes its way to an editor, either David or I. Um, we do some kind of initial screenings. 
Um, sometimes there's a, a problem that needs either um, immediate, immediately to be addressed, or maybe there's um, such a poor fit um, with the journal and the paper that things stop there. Uh, we'll talk about that later. If the if it's um, you know there's some potential for the paper to be published, what we'll do as editor is send the paper to an associate editor, and so there's a team of about thirty people who are serve as associate ed editors for the journal, and they are specialists in all sorts of different topics. So we will find one of the associate editors who's got expertise um, closely related to your um, topic and ask them to um, uh, take a closer look at the paper. Now, they may um, make a judgment uh, immediately. That's not super common, but it, it does certainly happen um, often. And, and if they judge that the paper is potentially publishable, they're going to go solicit those peer reviewers. Um, so with Earthquake Spectra, we aim to get three peer reviews. Um, and so this is... Um, other people that have expertise in the topic of the paper, the associate editor invites them to review that paper and provide reviews. Now we go back up the right-hand side. So the reviewers are going to provide those reviews back to the associate editor, commenting on you know, the scope of the paper, the contributions, if there are issues that need to be addressed before the paper could be published, or whether maybe the paper doesn't um, merit being published. The associate editor is going to collect up all of those reviews and make a recommendation to the editor for what we should do with the paper. And um, again, that could be a publish or revise the paper or reject it. Ultimately, the editor is going to make a decision that, that's usually following the recommendation of the associate editor. Um, the associate editor, you know, they have to do a little bit of synthesis here because the reviewers may not all agree. Um, there may be kind of variations in um, things or some of the reviewers may be more informed than others or have been more careful than others. But, but the associate editor does that synthesis, makes a recommendation to the editor, the editor will then make a consideration of all that information uh, and then make a decision uh, that makes its way back to the author again. So that, that's the whole process going on and why it looks very quiet for you for a little while after you submit. Just a quick addition, Jack, that the paper before it gets to the editor actually goes to the managing editor, uh, the publisher, and he will, uh, Hunter Hayes, he will look at it and make sure that all the pieces are there, everything that's necessary, cover letter, uh, and any supplements that you might have so that when it goes to the editor, it's been at least QA'd in terms of the components to it and the, the roughly the format. Uh, and so that that can take a couple of days for the the um, uh, managing editor to get to it before it goes to the editor. So so up on the screen, here's some statistics from uh, kind of re recent papers going through the system. Um, you know, if you think through kind of all the different people who have to look at this paper and, and spend some time trying to understand the contributions and, and scrutinize the work. Um, hopefully you can see that it, you know, it, it takes a little bit of time to get through all this, but you know, it's on the order of um, you know, weeks to a small number of months for things to go through this process. Um, it's also, um, you know, it, it varies somewhat depending on kind of the reviewer time. So we're, when we're trying to get multiple reviews, the, the slowest reviewer is holding us up and, and, um, and uh, part of our job as editors is to try to keep those holdups as short as possible by bugging our reviewers, bugging our associate editors, making sure that we're you know keeping our anything in our queues um, processed quickly. But, uh, but we certainly appreciate that quick turnaround from paper submission to a decision is really important for authors and really important for the the readership as well to make sure they're getting kind of timely information about um, contemporary scholarship. So so that's a big part of um, kind of managing this process is trying to keep these times as short as possible. And, and I, I've been on the side where it's, uh, you know, frustratingly long and you're waiting, waiting, hoping to hear back. Um, so I can, I can get that, um, you know, I certainly um, make that a priority that, that this quick turnaround is, is important and we do everything we can to keep these turnaround times as, as short as possible. That's a, definitely a high priority for us. Um, a couple notes about submitting a manuscript to uh, Earthquake Spectra. So here's a screenshot of uh, of the website. It was recently revamped to try to um, add some more functionality and get you interesting things as a reader. Um, there's red boxes around a couple of blocks um, there on the right. So first to call your attention at the lower right, um, there's, a, there's a panel down the right side of the web page. One of the buttons says, or one of the links says submission guidelines. So when you're getting close to you know thinking about publishing with Spectra, preparing your paper, go read those submission guidelines really carefully. Um, there's all sorts of information in there about Kind of what we're looking for and, and um, you know limits on lengths and formats and things like that um, and complying with all of that will really smooth the process out um, so so um, you know we've put a lot of time into making that as clear and comprehensive as possible so take advantage of that hey jack i would have put a box around the impact factor <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, we're, we're yeah, we're watching, uh, you know, for impact factors and watching for, you know, more importantly, kind of real impact, but that's one metric of, uh, of our real impact um, is these impact factors. Um, just to the right of those impact factors is, is this button where you can go enter into our web portal where you submit your paper. Um, and that includes, you know, uploading your document of your paper, but, but also some supporting information that'll help us with processing your paper. Uh, <clears throat> one thing you'll notice in the in those author guidelines and then in the in the system once you start uploading your information is you have to check a box indicating what type of manuscript you're submitting. So just to highlight this, you know, most of you are probably thinking about research papers. Um, that's the kind of the traditional um, document that's published in academic journals is a some new piece of scholarship that's got a new you know insight or, or contribution uh, in some way, and you you document the the methods and the results that get you to your conclusions. So that's the, that's the big majority of papers in Earthquake Spectra as well, but it's not the only type of thing that we publish or are interested in. Um, so just to briefly call out, so we, we do publish opinion pieces on occasion. So this is more of a uh, an informed opinion uh, or a persuasive piece that's not necessarily founded on kind of classical research. It doesn't mean you can just yell about anything you, you care about. It's, it still has to be um, justified and it will still go through some level of review, but but not with the same metrics as a traditional research paper. Um, we also have these practice papers, and I think this is an interesting and important one for us as a journal of a, um, a professional institute where we have both kind of uh, researchers as well as practitioners. So if there's some work that you think is of of, um, of interest to the um, practice, um, so this could be like a case study project or a new development uh, professionally, um, and it's not classical research, but, but it's of interest to our readership, um, that's a great category to take advantage of um, there. So, you know, updates to code provisions and or how, how somebody's worked through a particular challenge on a project, those types of things could be of great interest there. Um, we also have data papers. This is a growing um, growing in popularity as a category. So if you have a data set that you've published publicly and you want to um, provide some documentation of kind of how was it produced, what are the characteristics of, of you know features in the data set, um, what are the types of uses that could be used for, um, this is an interesting way to document that data and also produce a, a document that you can get credit for as an author of data. So sometimes a experimental, uh, large experimental projects can have a data set produced from them that would work here. Uh, ground motion data sets are a, a relatively popular um, way of doing this. Uh, recorded ground motion data sets, sometimes simulated ground motion data sets, for example, um, but not limited to those cases. And then finally, book reviews. So if, if there's a new um, book that's come out, that's kind of closely aligned with the topics that Earthquake Spectra focuses on, uh, we will publish reviews of those books, again, to help the, all of these are trying to help the readership, right? That's the final lens is like, will the readers of the journal benefit from this uh, document and, and telling readers about a new book and providing a review of it is a, a valuable contribution as well. So we have um, maybe a few a year of book reviews. All right, so those are, those are our kind of general categories, uh, particularly if you have a, something you're thinking about submitting that's maybe um, a little unusual or maybe in one of these categories you haven't worked with before, you know, feel free to shoot David or I a note. Um, we sometimes will just get a quick informal inquiry of like, here's this, you know, here's this case study project that I worked on. I think it would be interesting for the readership. Is this worth my time to, you know, submit it? And here's the category I'm thinking of. We're happy to give some quick feedback. Um, that doesn't guarantee a, a decision one way or the other, but we could either, you know, say, oh, it's, it's not a good fit or it's a good fit uh, if you focus this direction or, Here's a few things to keep in mind as you um, proceed down that path. Um, we're happy to give you kind of that quick um, feedback before you spend a lot of time getting everything formatted up uh, for submission. Yeah, and I, I really encourage more opinion pieces. They they, they get a lot of um, airtime and they're, they're very very visible. Uh, and that includes comment and replies to uh, previous papers. So uh, keep that in mind. Okay. Um, so you yeah. So when you're submitting, you got to think about that that category of a paper. Um, another thing we need when you submit is a cover letter. Um, so this is something that it varies a little bit in how people handle it. Um, this is a screenshot of our um, submission guidelines. So we do have some submission there. Uh, but then this box gives you a little bit of extra information here today. So really, this is your chance to um, kind of explain to the editorial um, team kind of what's going on here. Just like when you're applying for a job, the cover letter gives some context and explains, you know, your interests or, or why you think you're a good candidate. So. You know, we'd like to, you know, briefly know who you are, um, particularly if you're a student or an early career scientist, that's that's helpful. We're certainly wanting to support, um, you know, young scholars, and, and it's helpful for us for calibration that, that, you know, either are, you know, if you're a 
a student publisher, maybe there's some things that you're, you're not as familiar with and we can kind of help you along productively with some feedback there, for example. Um, then, you know, if there's anything that's maybe not obvious to us in your submission, um, that would be really helpful to provide in the cover letter. A, a key one is if, if say, you're publishing a paper that's part of your um, thesis uh, or it was in a conference proceedings or something like that, we want to just be aware that there's some repeated material and we can um, make an evaluation. So in general, we'll, we'll accept a, a thesis chapter as a paper. If it's, again, if it's suitable as a paper, that's not counting as kind of self-plagiarism. But if there is content in a paper that has been published elsewhere before, um, our, our electronic screening systems are going to catch that duplication. And if you haven't flagged it for us, it's going to kind of put up our alarm bells of, is there some sort of a problem here? So, so just explain a little bit what's going on um, uh, if there's some portion of the material that may have shown up somewhere else in another context. Um, if there's anything else like, you know, specific to the situation, um, you know, let us know. So if, if there's a, a competing research group or there's some, you know, person who looks like they would be a good reviewer, but is maybe not uh, able to be unbiased in their evaluations, you can flag. Um, or if um, there's somebody who you think would be a great reviewer, you can let us know there. We're going to get a system in where you can formally just put in some suggested reviewers. But in the meantime, if if there's suggested reviewers you have in mind, you might note that in the cover letter. Actually, um, you don't need to kind of recap the entire paper. We're going to read the paper, but this is just a chance to give some information for us that might not have been obvious as we just looked at the, the paper. Uh, and then I guess the final bullet point in that box is about the novelty of the, the study. So that's going to be a quick screen we're doing is like, what is this uh, paper contributing or what's new here? That'll help us to make an evaluation if we if we see some potential for a careful review. And it'll also help us kind of identify the right associate editor and reviewers. Um, so the more you can point out what you're, you're claiming is, in, is novel in your work, the more that'll help us. Don't, don't re recap the abstract. It's hopefully in there or hopefully in the conclusions as well. But in a sentence or two, if you can mention kind of what you think is exciting or new about the work, that can help us, again, get ourselves oriented as we're coming through these papers as they come in. Hey, Jack, there's a question about conference proceedings. I think we should expand on that a little bit. So um, in general, conference proceedings uh, are not a complete paper. You know, there, there's a limitation to the uh, eight pages or, or so. Um, and what we would expect for a journal article would be uh, some novelty above and beyond what was permitted, uh, sent to this proceedings uh, in, in a more complete paper, you know, abstract uh, body conclusions and, and data and things like that. In general, um, I would say that there's some proceedings that are completely gray that won't make the light of day, but um, there's there's others that are pretty prominent in our in the engineering community. So, be be forward and tell us what's where it came from and, and what part of it is new and novel from from the proceedings. And and I, and I think that's that's pretty key to note. Keep in mind, um, we do and and we'll come back to this. Uh, we do run authenticate on on every paper that comes through. So. If it's in a thesis or if it's in a proceedings, we're going to know about that. So be be forward about that up front, so we so we can try to put that in perspective. Yeah, great. Um, and maybe just for folks that aren't as familiar, so Authenticate is is this on electronic service that will take your document and compare it to a some large library of documents out there in the world. Um, I, I don't understand the technology how they do that, but if it will highlight in your document kind of which passages are seen in other documents elsewhere, and we can easily click and see those. Um, so if we see big passages that are elsewhere and, and there's no, um, you haven't given us a heads up that that's going to happen, we're going to be concerned. Um, if you tell us, oh, there was a conference proceedings, but that was really preliminary work and we've substantially expanded upon it here. And, and I think it pops up that maybe some of the, the background and the methods are repeated, but all of you know the results are are completely new, then we can kind of check that out and say, okay, this is this is new scholarship relative to that conference proceedings, even if there was some overlap. So that's the the judgment that we're trying to make is is there something really um substantially new here? And if there is any sort of overlap with this this gray literature, this kind of non-archival literature, um, are, are we aware of it? And can we make that evaluation that it's not duplicating? Another good question, Jack, is um what about a review paper? Uh does to accept this type of submission we've had uh things that look like review papers and we don't call them review papers but we we had a recent paper that's very popular on uh overview of machine learning and, and earthquake engineering and so uh yes absolutely that would be a uh a, a very good thing to try to submit to spectra uh, yeah. it's not yeah. a, there's no formal review paper uh category though 
Yeah, I think we just take that as a research paper. That's probably a good topic that um, would be nice for an informal inquiry. So we did, um, you might say, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about doing a review paper on, you know, non-ductal concrete building performance. And, and we might be able to give a quick reaction of like, oh, you know, make sure that it's differentiated from this other review that came out recently or, um, you know, tell us a little bit about what you, what you think the opportunity is here. Um, so we're happy to go back and forth on those types of things. But as a category, yeah, review papers are certainly welcome. Okay, moving on. So, so you've submitted, you waited through that process while everything went back and forth. Um, and then you're going to get back an, an email at some later time and uh, having a decision in here. So the, the thing to be aware of, you're going to get a, a, a letter like this. It's starting as a form letter, but then we customize a little bit when we send it to you. And the key um, sentence that, that you're going to zoom through along with the other important context is this kind of this decision so it says like i'm rendering a revised for editor only decision and you're going to get some language in there that there might be you know our decision is to decline publication we, th we think there's some shortcomings of the paper that are so substantial that we don't want to proceed with reviews um we might render a decision that the paper is accepted that's basically never happens on the first submission there's always you know some small things that could be improved um and uh but then there's also um these kind of revised decisions which are common and it there might be some language in there about minor edits or major edits, where we're trying to give you a sense of like, how much do we expect a, a revised paper to be changed uh, if we were to undertake a re-review of it. Um, and if you get one of those decisions, um, you'll get a substantial, a more substantial set of um, comments and, and questions that need to be addressed. Sometimes with a reject decision, we'll, we'll provide a, a limited set of comments to explain the basis for the decision, but we won't go in, in great detail. Um, because we're not expecting a response that's going to address any of those comments. So you'll get that letter. It'll have a set of um, uh, issues for you to address or questions to answer or clarify. Um, and then you're going to go back and do some work and resubmit. So what happens at this resubmission stage, it, it kind of looks like the first submission where you upload um, a cover letter and a paper, but you've got a little bit of extra work to do as well. Um, so the cover letter, the new cover letter, you might um, provide some context for the reviews. So, so I know with my own work, sometimes I might say in the cover letter, you know, a theme of the uh, comments is, you know, a number of people had questions about this aspect of our work. And at a big picture, you know, we, we did some reanalysis and we re repackaged that in the following way. So it's not really responsive to any specific comment, but it's a, it's a higher level um, issue. Or, or maybe we might say, you know, the first two reviewers were pretty spot on and we've addressed those. We really think reviewer three was kind of too personal or was out of you know misunderstanding our our contributions and so we haven't been as responsive there we're just, we're just trying to give some high level context um then in terms of the more detailed um responses you're going to want to provide a a copy of the manuscript that that calls out um what's changed in the manuscript so that that could be a um you know colored text for the revised parts or highlighted text something like that and then you're also going to provide a, a response document so this this kind of middle bottom or right bottom uh, box are showing a couple of ways those can be formatted. But basically you're gonna have a list of all of the, the comments or questions that the reviewers raised and following each of those or corresponding to each of those, you're gonna provide some explanation of how you uh, responded. And as a default, I would respect, recommend that your response include some change to the document. Um, so as a, uh, and, and even if you, your response is, you know, the reviewer didn't quite understand what my point was, the, the paper should you know change in order to make sure that the next reader doesn't have the same misunderstanding right so you can say I'm, I'm not i'm not changing my my conclusions about the work but i've changed the paper to clarify what i mean so that the, the next reader doesn't have the concern that the reviewer did or maybe the reviewer pointed out some sort of shortcoming in your work and you might change the um the results you present or do some additional analyses to help um probe that issue a little bit more if every one of your responses is just that the reviewer was out of line and they misunderstood and you know, nothing changes in the paper. It's not going to be very persuasive that uh, we think the paper has been improved enough that the decision would change. Um, so, so that's something to think about. One, one quick quick question came in, Jack. On uh, conference proceedings, always get a preliminary, very preliminary, uh, and not so correct in the journal. We might have a better uh, and right result. So, in this case, do we still need to notify about proceedings? I think uh, we're probably on the same page. I, I think it's uh, important to uh, let people know or let the uh, AE and the, and the editor know that some part of this is out there. And that has many reasons. Um, 
one is that you really uh, some things are copyrighted, and we have to know about where where it's uh, where we need permissions, and figures may be copyrighted as well. So it's always important to to say what content comes from where if it's if it's duplicated. We will see that through authenticate anyway, so you might as well be straightforward about that. Yeah, I think anytime that you're you're um, re reviewing an editorial team to get surprised by something, it's not going to be good. Um, it, it kind of raises suspicions about kind of the broader issues and, and, and kind of creates some frustration if we have to work through things. So um, it doesn't hurt to flag. I think we'll probably get to this in a slide or two, but so it could be, you know, some document that you've produced that has similar material. It could be a prior study that, that this next study is building off of. If, if we don't have, if it's not clearly flagged or not, you know, clearly cited in your paper and we find some similar work out there um, by you or others, it's not acknowledged in the paper. That's, that's a, a very concerning um, symptom. So the more you can be kind of open with us and explain kind of where this document sits relative to your own, you know, uh, body of scholarship or related scholarship by others, um, the, the better. I think you can't you can't really overshare in this situation. Okay, um, so papers do not every paper gets um, published in the journal. Only about half of the papers end up getting published. Half the papers that are submitted, um, and so we thought, you know, that's that's not a good outcome for the author, of course, um, and it's not. You know, really great for us if we're, um, you know, spending a lot of time working with authors that have committed effort and, and not got an outcome they want. So, you know, it's part of our mission is to kind of be clear about what we're looking for and, and make sure that we do get material that's aligned with our mission. So, some things that, that happen often um, is we will sometimes get papers that are just not matching our readership's interests. Again, you know, if you always have that readership in mind um, when you're preparing and submitting your paper, you're going to be better off. We're all going to be better off. You know, sometimes we'll get things that's just out of scope for us. Um, you know, we might get something about like a nuclear power plant performance or something. And there's just a there's a hint of like dynamics in there. And you're like, well, that's a hint of maybe earthquake. But it, but it really raises the question, like, why is this coming to Earthquake Spectra rather than a, a nuclear power journal or something like that or a mechanics journal? Um, and so really, you know, help us understand why why this paper is coming to Spectra specifically and not one of the 25,000 other journals that exists in the world. Um, so that's sometimes it's just topically it's not a good fit. Um, a big one is is kind of lack of novelty or minor advances, kind of incrementalism. And, and this is gray, right? It, it sometimes takes some evaluation of is is an advancement kind of small but but important, or is it really um, pretty minor? And um, so here, this is a lot of our job is to try to evaluate this: is is this work really new compared to what's been known before, or is it really prior techniques just applied in a slightly different situation? Um, or is there work out there that's not been kind of cited and explained what the differentiation is? So um, the more you you have clarity of like what you're contributing um, beyond the existing scholarship, and the more you clearly communicate that to us and ultimately to your readers, uh, the better off you'll be there. Um, sometimes we get just really um, hard to follow papers, right? So the, the paper could be really poorly organized, they haven't really said clearly what the contribution is, or the quality of writing is, is so low that we just can't follow the thinking um, that, you know, that it just makes it so hard for us to evaluate, right? Um, and so there might be some interesting ideas in there, but it's just not, it, we're not able to discern that as a reader. Um, and so I think you can, you can do yourself a favor, um, in particular, you know, have people read your paper prior to submission, we shouldn't be the first people reading it besides you. Um, and, you know, we understand that, that not everybody is a native English speaker and, and if we won't expect kind of beautiful prose from, from everybody, but organization and, and stating your contribution and um, kind of basic grammatical correctness, those are kind of minimum bars for us to, to go through in, in order to understand the, the scholarship and evaluate it. Um, so, so, you know, definitely put some, put some effort to that. And um, then, you know, another thing that sometimes happens is we will review a paper. We'll say that, you know, there's something here potentially, but we've got a set of review comments that um, need to be addressed. And if the authors come back just arguing with the vast majority of those and, and um, not really trying to address them in a, in a good faith effort, um, it, we get kind of stuck because we, we don't have any basis to accept the paper based on the prior reviews and the, and the revised paper hasn't done anything to address those concerns. And so at that point, if we see, you know, there's not a path towards getting these issues resolved, we're gonna move on um, and just reject the paper. So it's really in everybody's interest for you to be responsive. That doesn't mean you have to take every suggestion, you know, literally and respond to every one of them, 
exactly as a reviewer asked, but but engage seriously with them and, and see what you can do to improve the paper in response to those questions. How about we take a, a, an example? Uh, how about an article on research of a new building structural element idea for seismic performance currently being tested? I'll let you take that one. <laughs> <laughs> Good, yeah. So um, the research of a new building structural element idea for seismic performance currently being tested. I mean, so there, there's a... An, try to read this back for the audience. So there's a phrasing about an article about something currently being tested. You know, I think I'd be interested to, to see those tests concluded. You know, perhaps you're planning ahead of time um, for a paper, but we'd want to know kind of what the tests showed and kind of what insight came out of that. Um, and, um, but, but I think new structural elements and kind of any sort of building system that is improving seismic performance, that, that certainly matches Spectre readership's interest to hit this first uh, bullet point. That's the type of topic we're interested in. Um, so then it'll really be, um, you know, can you can you explain kind of what's what's novel here, or if it's more on a practice paper side, you know, what what about the study or the or the testing is going to give a you know, insights that are interesting for our readership. That that'll really be the question that we'll be asking. Um, but as a general principle, that sounds like a, a good topical fit. Well, that that led to another one. Uh, how about an article uh, regarding seismic microzonation work? That's a little trickier. Uh, I would say maybe. <laughs> uh, is it, it really, Jack said it right, is it of interest to the Spectre readership? And um, there are other journals that would have the site characterization and, um, and pure seismological journal uh, may be appropriate. At the same time, if it's related to infrastructure, related to the exposure at that particular location, it may be very important to the readership. So um, it, ping us and, 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 and ask if, if you, if you want to, get an opinion about a specific uh, implementation of that. Yeah. Um, another one came in, is, is your good word? It's good that we're getting into some specifics here. So there's a question or a comment. Sometimes things might not be completely novel, but would contribute to society and the practitioner. Um, so yeah, I mean, and maybe this comes to this uh, microzonation um, question as well. So we sometimes will get something that's it's a, certainly a useful product, like a, a hazard map or a microzonation study. Um, but we have to think about like would the would the readership you know benefit from seeing it here versus somewhere else? Also, is you know remember this this is a peer review process. So would the work benefit from a peer review? So if it's a if it's a study that uses kind of established methods and is just providing kind of numerical results that are of practical use, but there's not really anything to um, kind of review or not anything methodologically interesting. You know, that starts to raise questions of, is this just a better as a technical report um, or a, an agency map versus like being published in a peer review journal? Uh, so we, we'll, we'll sometimes have to make some judgments about that. Um, and that would be something to think about here. And, and so I think the question was, you know, from that member was, you know, is it um, contributes to society and the practitioner? So I think, um, you know, if you have an idea that you think contributes to society and the practitioner, um, just try to articulate that, you know, the more clearly you can, you can articulate what, what that contribution is from your perspective, the more, um, effectively we can evaluate if that contribution is a good fit with the journal and, and the same for other journals as well, right? All this advice is going to apply if you, if you go to other places as well, that if it's, if it's muddy, what exactly it is you're trying to contribute or muddy, you know, what it is that the readership might benefit from it, it, the outcomes tend to be a lot less, um, favorable, I would say. Shall we go on or should we take yeah. questions as we go? Let's see. Is there any? Yeah, some more kind of detailed ones. Um, yeah, why don't we keep going? But, so, um, so as I just said, you know, yeah, responsive to reviews. Let's, let's talk about this a bit. So I've been in the case in the, in the situation certainly many times where I get reviews back and I don't agree with the reviewers fully. Right? And I think, oh, they didn't, they didn't read carefully enough or, you know, they're, they're saying I didn't address something, but it's, it's right here on page five. Like I said that. Um, so I think just what I tend to do as in, in, in my author's shoes is I'll kind of read all those reviews and just kind of see what's in there. And I'll just put it down for a day or two and, and not, not kind of react emotionally or, or try to visualize exactly how it's going to play out. Just give myself a little time to think about it. And then I, I kind of pick it back up with the perspective of the reviewer and the editors, right? So, so these are people who are volunteering their time. Um, you know, the associate editors and the reviewers are, are not paid anything. 
Um, editor in chief is paid. Um, I'm not sure how it's legal because it's it's far less than minimum wage. Um, so it's it's not a good way to uh, to make a living for sure. Um, in, any of these people, it's it's really effectively all voluntary. Um, and so they're they're working hard on top of a day job, and they they have to kind of move through these things, these documents that they've never seen before. So they sometimes get things a little bit wrong, um, but they're you know volunteering their time to try to make your work better. So, so just if you keep that in mind, it's it's a lot less frustrating if you, if you feel like they missed something or they didn't you know they didn't uh, quite understand something that you feel was clear. The other thing is just keep in mind that those may be the people who read that paper as closely as anybody in the world, right? They read it really carefully with an eye towards a decision. The future readers are probably going to read it even less carefully. And so, if they got confused about something that you felt was clear in there, okay, they missed it. But also, maybe you have an opportunity to further clarify. And so. You know, keep that in mind um, when you're trying to respond to those uh, comments that, that even if the, your answer is you missed it, um, you can still answer you missed it, but I'm going to try to make it even more clear or make sure there's no ambiguity um, so that it's even easier next time for the next review here to understand that. Also, if, if, if you get a decision back that uh, uh, your manuscript was rejected, um, you can appeal that decision. So we have a, an appeal process um, and the, the editors are not infallible, certainly. Um, you would we don't want to have an appeal that's just that you don't like the decision um what you need to do is make clear that there was some sort of an error um or that there was like some sort of information missing and you can bring kind of new information to the table um and we have an ombuds person to handle this um uh, farzad naim so a very very distinguished uh engineer in our our field and he's a, a lawyer as well as an engineer so he's got kind of good uh, understanding of disputes and, and resolution so we take those reviews or, or those appeals um, to, or they'll go just to, to uh, Farzad, not to the editors. And if he looks at it all and says, oh yeah, the editors did make a mistake here and um, there was some sort of an, uh, an error, um, that, that decision can be uh, overturned. So that's that's fine. And it's, it's good for us to not have to be the final word if there was some sort of mistake made. Just be under, understand that you don't want to head down that path without some sort of clear evidence that there's a problem because if it's just a judgment that um, the reviewers felt like it wasn't a substantial enough uh, novel contribution and the author felt like it was, that's that's going to be more of a matter of, of judgment. And um, we do have to kind of defer to the editors and things uh, in those cases. So it needs to be something more like an error um, or, or bias, uh, evidence of bias or something like that. Those are the ones that we do want to consider very carefully. By the way, we're going to get to all the questions in the in the Q and A. Yeah, they're piling up here. Yeah, but that I really thanks for all these great questions. We'll get to them all for sure. Yeah. Um, so in terms of, of clarity, so I, that was kind of mentioned, and um, a slide or two back, there are there is a typical structure to these um, research papers in particular. I'm kind of noted down the left. So you you want um, kind of an abstract that that summarizes the. The problem being addressed and the methods used to address it and kind of key conclusions and then you want in your main text to you know have an introduction that provides some context for what's you know why is there a problem in the field why hasn't it been addressed previously and then kind of a methods where you explain what you did and a results where you explain what you found and the conclusions at the end so those are kind of key sections in that order papers that kind of wildly deviate from this um are i think that's a not a great strategy um, number one it can be a sign of kind of convoluted thinking and 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 um and it can be hard for a reader to follow you know what the arguments are and what the conclusions are um and so the more we kind of stick to this typical paper structure and only deviate in kind of cases where it's really well justified um i think everybody's better off so you don't want to write um kind of a chronological story of everything you did and what happened you don't want to kind of tell a novel where you build tension for the first half of the paper and then resolve that tension later um, you know, readers of scientific papers are not uh, willing to put up with those types of things. So, um, so think about this structure. Um, David started um, putting this this right half of the slide over here, so I'll I'll talk about it, even though it's my own um, contribution. So, I've in the last couple of years been trying to write some advice on these topics, and there's a um, I've got an article at this URL noted at the upper right about writing a paper, um, where I've really tried to think through from my own experience and working with advisees. Um, that you don't just start with kind of writing your page one of your paper and right through to the end that you know you start by really figuring out the scope and the conclusions of your work and then building out an outline and then filling in that outline and i kind of walk through it in, in a detail over a few thousand words and so if, if this is kind of a new experience to you or you you haven't had kind of good experiences um 
uh, submitting papers in the past, there, there might be some good insights there that help you with a, a kind of a structured process towards developing this. And then the, the more structured and organized you can be in developing your work, the easier it's going to be for the reviewers and ultimately your readers to understand what you've contributed. Um, some other things to think about as you're preparing your work and submitting it um, is, you know, keep in mind we've got a specific format. Now, you don't have to get the fonts right and the, um, you know, the headings and things right. We're going to retype set your work. Um, but there are some things that are um, important for you to keep in mind. So we don't have, say, we don't have numbered sections. So if you write a document that's making references to section two and section four all over the place, that's going to kind of not work in our um, typesetting format. Um, you know, our citations are citing by author and date, not numbered citations and things. And, and when we see stuff that's wildly deviating, deviating from that, um, it's either kind of a sign of, of lack of careful preparation or a sign that maybe we're getting a paper that's been rejected elsewhere and the author's just submitted here without trying to update to our format. Um, so so get it get it right. We've got lots of guidance on what we're looking for with our format. We also have length limits, um, at least length limits if you want to not pay for over length charges. And so you know, just be be aware of what those formatting requirements are um, and, and comply with those um, within reason. We also um, are increasingly emphasizing, um, you know, the data, underlying data and codes um, in the interest of making your work more useful. So it's, it's, it's empirically shown that people who are sharing their data and codes are much more impactful. They're much more highly cited um, and their work is, you know, recognized um, more. And so uh, the whole academic world is moving this direction. So we'd really love to see your code and your data shared. Um, we've got guidance on that um, in our author guidelines as well. Um, but the more you can do that, um, that's it's going to make your work more impactful. It's also easier for us to review. If sometimes if we can see some supporting codes and things, we can poke around in there a little bit to clarify things that might not have been clear just from the paper itself. And so uh, those are all really useful things uh, for your enhancing your scholarship. Um, okay, so so that's on your side um, as an author. A little bit about reviewers now. So so we up in that earlier diagram, I talked about associate editors finding reviewers. Um, so that's an important part of um, the job of the um, editorial board. Uh, just for your awareness, if you've never kind of seen it from that side of things, the, those reviewers get found um, sometimes through just the knowledge and experience of the associate editors. So. When I'm taking on that role of inviting reviewers, I'm thinking about you know who are people that I um, am aware of who are you know good scholars in this area. If I've got any experience with them before as a reviewer, are they are they provide thoughtful reviews? Do they provide timely reviews? That's important. Um, and I will go to people that I trust their opinions on a particular topic. Um, but I don't want to work off just my own personal experiences. So I'll also you know we'll look at the references in the paper. So if you're citing some prior work that you're building on. We might go to the people who did that prior work to evaluate um, yours and, and evaluate if you really, you know, move beyond. We, of course, um, you know, that's only a, an evaluation from those people and we understand their context. Uh, they might have a particular perspective on your innovations. Uh, you can suggest people as well. If you if you know of people you think could provide informative reviews, so that can be great. Let, so Jack, can, yeah. On that, on that one, um, Sage, our publisher, no longer asks you for recommend uh, suggestions for uh, reviewers, but you can put that in the cover letter, and it's something that we can use or not use. It's up to the uh, editor and the associate editors whether to pursue that. But um, sometimes you do have good ideas, and that's really, really helpful. So consider that in the cover letter if that's uh, the direction you want to head. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, so there's no obligation um, for, to press to use your suggestions, but... Um, you know, as again, as an author, my goal is to get feedback from the most informed and most kind of motivated readers of, of that paper. And so if there's people I have in mind that I could imagine being really great, I'd rather than, you know, just hope that the associate editor has the same ideas, I might just put those names forward as an author. Along those lines, if you've already had it reviewed, I, I you know, uh, at least U.S. government, USGS re, uh, publications have already had internal review before it's submitted. And it's always nice to say who's looked at it and who's done what prior. It it, it doesn't hurt to mention that in your cover letter. Yeah. Um, and then sometimes we just go to online um, uh, tools as well. So we don't we don't know everybody. And, and um, particularly if there's a, you know, a field that we're, you know, why not to have kind of reviewed heavily in before. Um, we can use things like Google Scholar looking at prior literature or um, our internal um, paper handling system has some built-in databases and things like that 
Um, we also have a list, and you may have seen this, that EERI will make a call for people interested in reviewing. Um, so if you've signed up to um, volunteer to review, we have a, a long list of those people, and we can sometimes browse that list looking for people who um, are, are motivated to participate and, and can provide reviews on a given topic. As a as the advice I have for you as an author is to volunteer to review. Um, so from a big picture, it really helps to have review volunteers because this whole system depends on volunteer reviewers. And so uh, if you want your papers to be published as an author, you know, contributing on the other side to make the machinery work is important. But I more selfishly, you're going to learn a lot as a reviewer. So I try to get my own graduate students uh, some reviewing experience as a, as a graduate student because it really opens your eyes when you're looking at a paper from the perspective of a reviewer. And you can I've seen students many times go through and say, well, I can't follow this argument that the, the authors have made a drawn a conclusion that they haven't really supported with their um, evidence. And then they kind of turn back to their own work and they realize the habit that they fall into. And they're like, oh, you know, it was obvious to me as the scholar that this conclusion followed, but I didn't really make that clear in my own paper. And so when you see the things that work really well or the things that don't work well in other people's papers, it can really help you refine your own writing. Um, and I think I'm a much better author because of the, all the review work I've done. Um, and I'm also much better at avoiding problems that I've seen in other people's work, um, as I've learned over the years. So, so definitely volunteer. Um, so you can volunteer when EERI makes a call occasionally. You can also just reach out to um, David or I or to the associate editors on the board. You can, um, if you're a graduate student, you can talk to your advisor about getting involved, um, and they can make suggestions to folks as well. Um, so those, you know, making your willingness uh, apparent to people and get you in that system and, and can be really beneficial selfishly as well as for the broader community. Okay, um, let's see. So, so yeah, so our final topic was why earthquake specter, right? So a lot of the, the topics that we have gone through are, are really universal to a lot of journals and, and those same issues about being clear about what your contribution is and organizing your paper well, that's, that should be true no matter where you submit. Um, but we would like to see you submit to Earthquake Spectre. Um, and so, so here's why. And, and I'll say, you know, this is not just, it's, I'm not on commission or anything like that. It doesn't, uh, it makes more work for us to have more submissions. So it's, it's not a, anything selfish, but, um, you know, David and I are voting with our feet. We're spending a lot of time in this role because we care a lot about this journal and, and care about the Institute. And so I want to just share with you why. Um, to me, this is, yeah, this is frankly my favorite journal to be working with and the one where I spend my time. So some reasons are, you know, this the EERI is focused on both research and practice. I think that's a really cool um, niche that there are some journals which are extremely academic. They're very high quality, but they're really for academics and by academics and nobody besides academics is ever going to see that work. Um, and that's got its place, certainly, and, and I'll participate in those sometimes. Um, you know, here, you know, we have we have scholarly research, but we also have this big readership and authorship that's coming from practicing engineers. And it's this interface between kind of innovative scholarship and, you know, real world um, challenges and complexities that I think creates a very rich environment to be working and a great audience as well. If you're doing academic research that you think has practical impact, this is a great place for your work to get in front of um, practicing engineers. We'll talk in a minute uh, about accessibility. This is a much more accessible journal to a lot of practicing engineers. Audience is also multidisciplinary, right? So we call out really, you know, earthquake science and earthquake engineering. Um, there's a large social science component, uh, you know, a big uh, celebration of, of multidisciplinary work and the, the challenges around earthquake resilience being, you know, needing contributions from a lot of fields. And so if you're doing multidisciplinary work, I think a lot of times that can be a little harder to slot into a traditional disciplinary journal and you might have a, have a great home here. You know, it's a very well-respected uh, journal internationally, right? We have editorial board that's that's from all around the world, authorship from all around the world, distribution all around the world. Um, David noted the, the high impact factor and growing impact factor of the journal is a, that's a, for those that don't know, that's a metric of kind of how often the work is cited. Um, and that's, you know, a sign of the relevance of the work when the papers are very, being cited frequently. There's also a lot of work um, that we're doing to promote the papers from the authors. So, there's these earthquake spectra highlights um, that you're, you're probably getting those if you got the word about um, this webinar. But uh, you know the editorial board. This is mostly David's work, um, as well as some of the spectra or the ERI staff. We put out these highlights to really try to um, you know draw attention to some of the contributions of papers in the journal that really gets a lot of viewership. And so um, the, the aim is to get your work in front of a lot of eyes. There's also this webinar series that that we're participating in here. 
Um, some of the you know compelling papers that are coming into the journal are getting selected to go into this webinar series and have the authors present to a, a live audience. Um, so again, another way for you to get your work out um, into a, a, a broader audience. And, and you know, we see our our work as you know doing you know work to improve the quality and screen the quality of the papers, but then get those papers out in front of as many people as possible so that they can have an impact. Um, and you should be trying to pick venues to publish your work where it's going to get in front of a lot of eyes and have some impact. And then the final note here is that this is an uh, it's an affordable journal to access. I think I've got another slide on that. Um, won't go in great detail, but but this was a little eye opening to me some some time back when I first heard it. But you know these academic journals, some of them are published by um, professional societies like Earthquake Spectra is published by EARI, and then some journals are published by for profit companies. And so these are companies that are um, their primary mission is to make money. And you know, selling journal subscriptions is one of the ways that they do that, or the primary way they do that. Um, ERI's primary mission here is not to make money; it's to support the academic society or the the, the ERI society. It's not just academics. Um, and so, you know, one way you can see that uh, this formatting got a little funny, but um, for institutions like university libraries that subscribe to these journals, the Earthquake Specter price is a lot lower than um, some of our competing journals. There's other journals like um, the ASCE journals. Those are also run by professional societies. Um, so that's you know that's in that kind of category. If you pick Elsevier journals, that's um, that's one of the um, notorious for-profit companies. The journal subscriptions are are very high there. Um, you know, there's other models. It's not to say this is the only model. So there are um, journals such as the Bulletin of the Seismological Society of America, which is very very cheap or free for readers, but the authors have to pay um, because there are costs associated with running the journals. Um, so that's a different type of model. There are also, you know, kind of these open access journals. Um, I think that's a compelling and interesting model, but it's got its own set of problems. Um, and so it's, it's none of these are free. And, and um, that, but I think the society um, academic journals tend to be my favorite in the sense that the the society running the journal is not incentivized to make as much money as possible. They're incentivized to, you know, provide the most value for their membership. And so to the extent you can, you know, publish in academic society or professional society journals, not for-profit journals. And, you know, Earthquake Spectre being first and foremost in my mind on that. Okay, um, start wrapping up here. A um, few notes, so I said, you know, reach out to um, us if um, you have questions or you want kind of a pre-screening. So that an, an easy email is this EQS editor at eeri.org. That'll go to David right now and in perpetuity goes to the editor in chief of the journal. Um, you know, we've got some websites here for the journal, um, both, um, looks like I think I got the same link twice, um, but they're, you know, pointing you back to where those uh, authorship guides are. And there's some other advice from Sage, who's our, who helps manage our publications. Um, this is the, the fourth bullet here, I guess, is the link to some of that advice that I've um, provided. And I guess in a box down below showing some of the topics. Um, so some ideas about effectively writing papers, how to respond to reviews, things like that. Um, if you're looking for a little more detailed context than what we had today, you might find that valuable. And then, yeah, some thank yous to uh, to a few key people. So there's there's a lot of people that are spending a lot of time to make this whole um, endeavor work. Um, so just to quickly run some run down some of these. Um, so Jonathan Stewart was the former editor in chief, who's still very involved as an advisor. Farzad, you heard about as the ombudsman person. Um, Heidi Germain, our executive director, is really involved in uh, operations. Um, Hunter Hayes does a lot of logistical work behind the scenes, um, making these papers get through and get through in a timely way. Um, we've got help from Sage, who's who helps publish this uh, journal. Um, Ethan also administers Elizabeth that's put together this webinar, among many other things, and is here helping this happen. And then I, I mentioned earlier, but there's about 30 associate editors that really are kind of perpetually on call, taking papers and trying to manage this all out. Um, so they're really a key cog in this whole thing and their their expertise and diligence makes this all happen. And then there's hundreds and hundreds of reviewers per year that are uh, giving valuable input that helps us get to good decisions on these papers. So uh, there's really, really a lot of people here and David and I are just here as the, kind of the mouthpiece of the whole operation today to offer some insights. Okay, so that gets to the end of our slide deck. So I think um, 
David, other comments, or do you want to take some more questions now for a while? Yeah, let's. Well, first of all, we're going to answer all the questions. We're going to stay on until they're all answered. We've got plenty of time for that. Uh, even though the top of the hour is what we planned for, we will be on for at least uh, as long as you need to be. So let's do that. Uh, I do want to also just acknowledge that um, the it, when you're impatient about a paper, keep in mind there's so much work that goes into it uh, on on our end. We get about 250 to 300 papers a year, so think about a paper every day or a day and a half, and then that goes to the uh, distributed among the associate editors. So there's quite a voluntary effort that that gets done to um, to make that happen. Uh, but let's now take some questions, Jack. Cool. Uh, we talked about the readership and the expected audience a little bit. Uh, just a little more on that one is that, I mean, the glue is earthquake engineering. And so, you know, we we have, when we sort out papers, uh, we sort them by different uh, subdomains and you have geotechnical engineering, uh, um, uh, loss estimation, response and recovery, earthquake um, engineering proper in terms of structural engineering, infrastructure, uh, and so it's important that the topic that you have or the subtopic has a glue that is earthquake engineering oriented. And I, I noticed there was a question that came in that we'd skip ahead to, which is about, say, PSHA. What would make PSHA uh, suitable for earthquake spectra? What kind of probabilistic seismic hazard analysis innovation would, would, would bring it to the attention of the journal? And I would say that, you know, one thing is obvious, like the National Seismic Hazard Map is what is used by the engineering community for a, a variety of different decision making and, and um, analysis and practice, as well as insurance and, and other tie ins to uh, our audience. And so when you when you think of the wider audience, think of the engineering community, as well as the social scientists, the uh, those that go out in the field for earthquake reconnaissance, the um, this the uh let's see where else are we going the geotechnical community the experimental and numerical simulations that go into earthquake engineering and and seismology as well but there are realms like pure seismology that don't have a connection to the engineers say for instance a source study or some kinds of things that are uh pure wave propagation that may not have to do with the engineering we'd have a hard time uh, justifying yeah Let's take. Yeah, go ahead. I thought I, you know, usually um, conversation I have with my authors when we're preparing a paper, and, and, and I flashed it on that slide is is you know one of the first things you should be thinking about is audience of like who is who is the people you're you know you think are going to be excited to read this work, and if that audience includes earthquake engineers in some some way or form, then you know consider us. If if you have like a yeah an earthquake source modeling study. You know, you'd say, who is my audience? And you probably head towards like earth scientists more quickly. Um, and maybe, you know, subsets of, of earth scientists. And, and when a paper like that comes to us, again, we ask the question, like, why is it here instead of a journal that's more focused on that topic? Right. And I think if, if you can have clarity of starting from your audience and then saying, well, earthquake specter is a place that, that matches with my intended audience, then we're going to be in good shape. If there's an argument that a, a different audience is a more appropriate audience. We're going to just have questions of like, why are we seeing this and not not the journal that addresses that audience more directly? Yeah, so Mohammed has a question. Is experimental work given preference over numerical simulations? That's great. I I, I never thought of it before. So the answer is no. Um, it, it really does tie back into whether or not the uh, the particular content is relevant to the readership. And, and it could be numerical. It could be empirical. It be, could be experimental. All good stuff. Anonymous question. Uh, what's the best way to follow up on a submission? Oh, no. Uh, 11 months ago and the revision addressing reviewers comments was submitted five months ago. Send the editor, that's uh, me, uh, editor in chief, uh, or spectra at eri.org uh, a note. We, like I said, we have 250, 300 uh, papers a year in the queue and then they stay for some time. So uh, we can forget things. We can lose track of things. We have systems to automatically remind us and to remind the reviewers and to remind the associate editors. But sometimes things get, um, you know, when it's in your court, sometimes you forget it's in your court and you have to get reminded. So by all means, send me a note. And I like getting those reminders because it keeps us moving forward. And so do, do send a note and don't feel bad about doing that. Um, it's, it helps us. Yeah. Okay. In your opinion, 
Oh, sorry. Yeah. How do you define novelty? Oh, that's a tough one. Uh, we know when we see it. <laughs> What's not novelty is easier to define. I think when you apply the same tools to a similar data set, um, uh, sometimes the data set itself is so enriching and so valuable for some particular earthquake or some some experiment that the same tools on a really novel data set can be in innovative. But you, you can't simply turn the crank and expect that to be worthy of earthquake spectra. Um, so that's a, uh, a consideration. Maybe you have some other thoughts, Jack. Yeah, to, to me, like the the best thing, it, it is a little bit um, tricky to evaluate sometimes, right? And, and we do kind of lose, you know, lose some sleep or, um, over trying to make that judgment. The thing I think you can do to do yourself a favor is if you can articulate, like, here is a problem that hasn't been solved previously, and I've I've put us in a better position with regard to that problem or that question, right? And it could be, an, it doesn't have to be like a world changing problem. It could be, you know, we have this liquefaction model and it's really designed for clayey soils. It doesn't yet work for gravelly soils. I want to evaluate on these gravelly soils if this model is appropriate, right? But, but there should be some sort of, you should be able to state a question or a problem and, and argue in your introduction that it hasn't been solved by others and that you've made some sort of progress, right? The, the, the problems where we, uh, where we've, things don't go well is if it's, Here's a technique that's been used before. I've got a different data set and I reran it. Or here's these, you know, tests I ran in the lab, and here's what the setup was, and here's a whole bunch of data. But like, what did we learn? Or like, what was the what was the question you were trying to answer? But if if it's just kind of a, a recitation of all the all the results you got from a bunch of calculations, and it's not grounded in some sort of a question or or a problem, that that's usually where the novelty issues uh, most often crop up. Crop up, and it doesn't mean you didn't work hard. <laughs> But we really need to understand, like, what is it that the reader is going to learn that they didn't know before? Yeah, great. So here's another question. This is from Kristen. This is really good. Uh, how do you consider, have you considered implementing a double blind review process? Single blind reviews can be very biased based on history, position, university, uh, all, all sorts of other um, biases. Great question. Yeah, so, you know, we're a pretty small field. Uh, if we are physics, you know, you can find uh, tons of uh, reviewers that are quite capable that are completely unknown to the authors. And uh, we we really don't have that luxury. There are there are lots of benefits of having a double blind um, review in that in that um, ability to be removed from the the uh, problem at hand and from the authors and the, and the knowledge of of the field. Uh, we we simply can't work that way. There's also that said, there's a lot of advantages to having um, your peers and your colleagues communicate with you through their support for your paper and and for making it better. And often some of those result in communications later on that result in very good, you know, collaborations and very good um, uh, relationships in, in our field with with the people that have reviewed your paper and that ultimately make it better. So um, we, we thought about that and it, it's very difficult to, to move from where we are now to there, um, but it, it's something that we keep thinking about. Yeah. You know, thoughts, Jack? Well, that's good. You know, one other thought, I think, you know, yeah, so we're certainly always thinking about like what could be better, right? And so things like the um, the data sharing policies were evolving because the, the world is evolving and there's better tools for sharing data and things. On the, the review process, you know, I, it's, it's an interesting question. There's there's kind of challenges with both. And it's not that one system is going to work great and the other system is not going to work. I think it's really a matter of making whatever system it is work as well as possible. And, and we're certainly cognitive of, of potential biases and and you know dis disparities in outcomes when it's not double blind. But I think as the editors, that's kind of our job as well as to take a step back. So maybe these, you know, these nice reviews come in for some famous professor and 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 the recommendation is accepted. We might just take a pause and say, like, is this is this potentially deference to a, somebody's reputation rather than like a real scholarly um, evaluation of the work? And we'll sometimes push back of like, you know, we need a little more, you know, uh, justification behind a recommendation if, if it feels too sparse or if something got rejected out of hand, um, and you know, maybe it was not a, a well known group. But we say, you know, there's there's is there a chance there's something here, and we can always kind of iterate inside. But I think that's. Um, Part of this multi-stage process is to try to do some checking of the reviewers and checking of the recommendations along the process to to minimize as much as possible any sort of outcomes that are based more on you know factors not related to the scholarship. Yeah, and that's important. If we, we always say all reviews are not created equal, uh, so if you have reviews that look to be biased, look to be 
uh, not independent and um, and have some kind of chip on their shoulder or something like that, let us know. Uh, it typically, um, that shows through in the writing pretty obviously, uh, but sometimes it's more subtle. So if it's subtle, let us know in your reconciliation statement that uh, you didn't think this was fair or, or, or whatever whatever your perspective is. Okay, yeah. Just be open about that. Right. Uh, next Maybe question. The risk of uh, dragging this one out. I'm going to jump in a little bit more just to try to make that a practical in, in, in the sense that like don't feel like you're you're somehow um getting overridden by these anonymous reviewers so when we are working on the back end we can see um on average how fast reviewers provide reviews and so if there's people that consistently provide slow reviews um we can see that and, and kind of make decisions to avoid those people if we also grade the quality of the reviews so if there's people consistently providing kind of ineffective reviews or not thoughtful reviews, we can kind of flag those and, and make sure to stay away from those folks in the future. Um, also, there, there, I, I can think of specific cases where I've gotten a review back and I thought it was inappropriate for various reasons, either the, um, it was a, kind of more of a personal evaluation rather than an evaluation of the scholarship or was uh, you know misreading things. And I'll just delete the review and the, re the author will never see it. And then the review won't play a role in, in the evaluation. So, so don't feel like, um, just because some reviewer got to see your paper with your name on it, that they somehow have all the power and you're without it really. Our job is to try to adjudicate and make a, the best scholarly outcome and not just to defer to one group over the other. So those are some real tangible ways that we're trying to manage that challenge. Yes, sounds good. Okay, question about LaTeX. As it, um, so it, the question is on the journal's website, it's mentioned that Word is recommended, but a LaTeX template is provided. Does that mean we uh, would make things harder for you if we submit a LaTeX manuscript are such uh, submissions quite unusual? So again, we don't really depend on the templates anymore. The the uh, and Word is typically the standard. It's the easiest thing to edit. It's the easiest thing to uh, correct. But um, if you if you're just equation laden, <laughs> we're not going to make you uh, squeeze that into a Word uh, document. So uh, if that's the case, by all means, go with LaTeX. Um, and and we'll LaTeX submissions are common. Um... And also for almost all of the process, except for the typesetter, we just work with the PDFs, not the, the raw document. So it makes no difference to the reviewers or to us. It's really just at the typesetting stage. So, so please do whatever is most uh, convenient for you. I, I write exclusively in LaTeX personally. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, Teresa, are, are papers on architecture and urban planning related to earthquake resistant building accepted? Oh, it sounds good. Please submit it. Um, yeah, absolutely. That That's uh, uh, right along the lines of what... Uh, uh, what we're looking for. Uh, that said, uh, we have to see it before we <laughs> pass judgment on it. Um, how do you become, uh, let's see, how do you become available to review other work? Good question, uh, Bradford. So we do have a process that Jack mentioned. You can send the editor, editor in chief, uh, or Spectra at ERI a note saying you're, you're looking to help contribute to Spectra by being a reviewer. And we put a list out and add to that list every uh, several months and it goes to the all the AEs and it's 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 sorted by um, you know topics. So let us know what your what your area of expertise is and um, then those are available then to to our AEs. And we are always looking for a new a new talent and and new energy because you know, we just don't have enough people to to get three reviews per paper uh, is challenging. So by all means, send a note to us. Thanks. Uh, next question. Can we publish the work while a paper is in the review process? Can we publish the work? Uh, for example, master's thesis on GitHub, the same or similar research is uh, given on paper while in review process because such work on PSHA has map needs to be put in the public domain uh, while the process is going on. So, yes, I mean, you can have content on a, on a preprint server. Um, and it can be certainly in a thesis that's that's either published or being work in pros, progress. That's not a problem. Again, always let the editor and the um, uh, through your cover letter what know what's going on. Um, but I don't think there's a, a problem that and and the fact that it's um, partially in the public domain is is not a concern. Any other thing to add there, Jack? Yeah, sounds good. I'm just looking at we have a um, update to our authorship guidelines that's coming out shortly. And we're going to explicitly say that preprints are uh, allowed. I think we're kind of silent in the current draft, but within a matter of weeks, we'll have that more explicitly spelled out. Right. Uh, what if we use others' work, but to a new case study area? Is it still novel? 
Oh gosh, that's a tough one. Um, we'll have to see it to, to, to make a judgment on it. Like Jack said, if you can describe what's novel about it, I think you go a long way to convincing the, the editor and the associate editor and reviewers of the same. Um, so new case study to me, you know, that, that, that could certainly be novel. Uh, let's see. How long is the processing time from submitting to be published? Jack, you want to take a stab at that? Yeah, I mean, we're in some of those statistics there. I mean, we're aiming for a matter of a small number of months. Um, you know, on occasion, things get, get drawn out a little bit further. Um, and anyway, I guess we should, maybe we could talk, take the advantage to uh, talk a little more about timeline. So, you know, from when it comes in to our kind of initial reads, and if there's any problems, you know, we want to get that done in days. You know, it might be a you know a month to two months to get your first reviews back is our our hope. Um, you know, from there on, it kind of depends on you a little bit as well of how how quick you get back to us and how smoothly the resolution goes. But another thing that we're just in terms of um, highlighting for you what we're doing to try to make this fast is that the system now we're getting the once the paper is accepted, we're getting it up online very quickly, um, and there's a DOI behind it, so it's it's officially published very quickly. We don't have any sort of like multi-month wait time before the paper goes into a printed copy of the journal before you can kind of consider it published. So um, there is, you know, the, the time from submission until it shows up in a print copy of the issue can be a little bit longer than when you see it online and it's got a DOI and it's kind of an archival accepted document that you can take credit for. So that, um, it's a slightly changed to your question, but uh, just to highlight that, that we are super cognizant that these turnaround times are really important for everybody involved. That's a high priority for us to keep that going fast and get your work out there as quickly as possible. Well, all reviewers are not created equal and all papers are not created equal. So some papers will go through very quickly because of the lack of need to go through uh, multiple revisions. We've never, I've never seen in, in the four years I've been doing this, a paper that had no, that was accepted as is. So you're in good company if you're, you're getting feedback. Uh, the other thing I always like to think when I get, you know, a, a major review comments and I, I get plenty of these, um, it's going to be a better paper when it comes out. And that's that's where, you know, if you put the energy into it and you follow the the lead from the reviewers, it, it will be improved. And I, I think that's the beauty of the whole peer review process. We take for granted that uh, what you submit, uh, it, it's going to be a much better paper when it actually gets published. And, and that's the beauty of this process. Uh, Anket, nice question. I'm a non-native English speaker. My reviewers pointed out numerous mistakes related to my English language, although I use Grammarly to improve the English. What can I do to improve my writing style in English? Uh, Jack made a good point about reading lots of papers, reviewing papers, contributing to reviews is really helpful. Um, another thing is, you know, if you have colleagues that are native English speakers or good writers, um, have some internal reviews done before you send, send it in. Uh, Grammarly is great. I think it's a it's a good idea to um, to have a, a good um, uh, grammar and editorial uh, review. If you still want to polish it up, you know you can get commercial uh, uh, um, uh, editors to to have a, a look at that, and you can kind of dial in how much work you want done on it. So that's an option as well. But I, I do think finding colleagues that are knowledgeable of the subject matter that are good writers. To go through it um, is a huge help, and to when you when you bring in those edits, try to understand why those changes were were suggested, and 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 try to avoid doing that over and over again, like I tend to do. <laughs> uh, let's see. Next question: What about uh, what about if the study area is totally new, but applied experimental method is not well established? Um, uh, do you give? to give a uh, weightage. Uh, again, um, uh, it depends. It, this is gonna be a tough one where you have to see the content and see what's what's really innovative or, or novel about it. Um, so I, I would say yes uh, in general, but we really have to see it to, to decide. Yeah. yeah, to me, it always comes back to like, can you answer the question for us of what was the thing that we didn't know that now we know? Uh, or what was the question that, you know, it was was of interest to some audience that that you're helping answer. But if you can say, you know, we didn't understand how this technique was going to work in some new situation, and and that was important because of the following reasons. And here's what we learned you know, from that. that. That's great. The problem ones is here's what we did. You know, this, this somebody had tested a three story building, and we tested a four story building. And here's a layout of the building, and here's what all the numbers were. 
in the end. Right? If you don't tell us like what did we learn, what was the question you were asking, you know that's important. So so when I when I see people when I see comments like it's a new case study or it's a new configuration, that that's potentially great, but it's not sufficient. It's you want to really be able to articulate like what is the question you're asking, and what is the thing that that the reader is going to learn that they couldn't have known without this paper. And if you can do that, you're generally in good shape. If you're really saying, well, I did a lot of work and I, I, you know, I have a lot of data, but I can't answer a question, you know, that I couldn't answer before, that that's where things usually get in trouble. Great. Uh, and the last question currently is topic or topics related to seismic analysis of dams in the scope of the journal. Sure. Could be, um, there's, there's a lot of different things I've seen over the years on, on, uh, dam analysis and, you know, it could be novel ways of, of looking at dam response. It could be a, a, a brand new data set that allows us to see what happened for a particular dam, a case history, uh, and uh, new new measurements, new recordings, new GPS uh, observations that can look tell us about displacement or geotechnical failure around the dam. There's lots of possibilities there. So absolutely. Oh, another question. Can development of the open tool of open tool in GitHub from the findings of others still be considered good and novel work, according to your opinion, or do you not consider it as not novel since it was already there? Again, that's a tough one. I think the um, you know a lot of the time analysis is done with existing tools, um, whether it's uh, you know. Um, I say Hazardous or some of the uh, FEMA tools that are out there. Some of the things in, in GitHub and GitLab are, are just fundamentally important tools. It really doesn't matter what you're applying it to. Uh, so again, we'd have to see it to decide uh, the level of novelty. Anything about that, Jack? I think that's great. In the paper, we felt that the reviewer had made an error. We politely point out a reply, but the reviewer got offended and got stuck <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah, these are, this is another good question. Um, there, you know, we're all human. And so we're, you know, we're sensitive to how things are phrased. And uh, I think that that's true of a review and, and back and forth and review, or it's true of a conversation. It's true when you're at the checkout line and buying groceries, how you phrase things does, does really matter. And, and, and same with the reviewers, how they phrase things and how it gets responded to. So uh, I like to give the reviewer the benefit of the doubt and and um, and and be generous and 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 respect their their contribution, their effort. And at some point, though, you know, you have to draw the line uh, and and make a solid argument for your case. There is the the broker. You have the you know the associate editor gets to decide who's being reasonable in cases where things uh, take a turn for the uh, the worse. Um, but but try not to. Go down that path. Try to be uh, generous in interpretations and and um, and kind in your interactions. Does social vulnerability after earthquakes merit a, a submittable topic? Oh, that's great. Yeah, in fact, um, earthquake reconnaissance, earthquake reports, earthquake uh, studies um, really, I think, are extremely valuable. They've always been part of the spectrum. So. Um, a social vulnerability is is a, a, a kind of a new twist on resilience that I think is 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 certainly a hot topic and, and absolutely would like to to see those kinds of submissions. Um, good, yeah. Our our social science uh, uh, audience is, is substantial in, in EERI, and and so I think there's very few places to go with that particular topic other than earthquake spectra. So great, great question. Um, Simon, uh, let's see, has the readership of the journal changed over time? If so, how? If not, where should authors go to check if Earthquake Spectre is the right place to submit? You, that's a good question. I'm, um, Jack and I are so young, we don't know the history of Earthquake Spectre. You know, um, I think it has changed. Uh, it, of course, it's expanded. The, the, the audience has grown completely. And, and I think the, the diversity of the, of the readership is what's really changed. And that's not just pure engineering, but the response community, the geotechnical community, the social science community, um, uh, uh, lots of different avenues. Uh, again, the glue is earthquake engineering. So I think that, um, that that covers a lot of ground, but mostly just talk to your peers. I mean, is it the right journal for um, for what your topic is and, uh, and, and how is their experience with the journal and how is their, their papers 
uh, you know, how widely uh, viewed and how widely cited are the papers that are in earthquake spectra. It's a good consideration. Another thing I'd suggest both for earthquake spectra and uh, other journals is we, and I think all journals have a, there's always a button on the front page that says aims and scope. And the journal is stating kind of what's what's their scope, what are they interested in, right? So earthquake spectra, I've got it up, it says, you know, it's the publication of record for development of earthquake engineering practice, codes and regulations, public policy. And so you should be able to see what we're calling out, what we think is important um, that we're covering. And um, if that doesn't align with uh, with what you're um, you know writing about, then you, know, you might find somewhere else. And, and so usually I'm I'm interested before I publish somewhere of uh, you know can I can I see something in the aims and scope of that journal that aligns with the topic I'm addressing? Um, and it may not perfectly align with the leader, readership, but it at least aligns with our aspirations. Yeah, great, great. Okay, we're getting some more good questions. These are great questions. Th thanks for everyone for staying on and and keep going on this. Uh, next question, uh, Anonymous. I appreciate the comment about the for-profit journals such as LCA. Uh, how do they differ from the work of Sage? That's a that's a complicated topic. The lay of the land for publishing is is a moving target, uh, as Jack mentioned, with open source journals. But pretty much somebody has to pay somewhere along the line. And one of the things I like to consider, and, and this is my bias being part of ERI and and um, and Spectra, is that. You know, a lot of nonprofit organizations depend on their membership fees and on other sources of revenue, including donations, but also their journals to to make sure they could stay afloat. Um, with profit for profit journals, the profits are pretty substantial. <laughs> these are these are really big companies, and the money is going to you know uh, corporate profits. Um, the any any funds that are part of your membership and and other contributions through your fees for earthquake spectra are going into ERI to to make sure we can do what we what we need to do uh, long term. So I, I see those as very different uh, strategies, um, and, and you should feel good about you know contributing to earthquake spectra and, and ERI directly through that that process. Yeah, but maybe yeah one other that's a, that's a fair uh, point to raise that. So we. This is a recent arrangement where we're using Sage to help us process the papers and, and typeset and, and distribute. Um, but the distinction is Elsevier journals, generally the, the for-profit company conceived the journal and launched the journal. They're in charge of kind of the marketing and the pricing strategy and all of that. And, and they're going to optimize with respect to kind of market opportunities. Um, in our case, EERI you know, owns the journal, owns the, the intellectual property, makes the choices about um, you know, priorities in terms of Pricing strategy and things like that makes it makes the papers available for free to the membership. Um, so, so the decision making and the leadership really, really lives at ERI still, and, it, and we're contracting with Sage to handle the the paper processing and the typesetting and some of the marketing. So they're they're not in charge; they're a partner that's helping us to kind of meet our goals. But the the values and the and the goals are being driven by the institute, not the publisher. Great. Uh, another good question. Uh, I hear that journals are regionally biased with regard to acceptance like U USA or Europe. Is that true? I, I think in general, it may be true. Um, we try, you know, we're an international uh, audience. We, or ERI is an international uh, uh, association. And um, in fact, Jack and I, looking at the next generation of associate editors, are very cognizant of the fact that we need to have associate editors to reflect the regions that we uh, represent uh, not only from the the perspective of ERI, but of of the world's seismic risks. So we are looking at having AEs in, in different parts of the world uh, for sure. Does that change the bias in terms of acceptance? It, it's a little tricky. Um, you know, a study that's relevant to San Francisco may have a, a, a slight edge over a study that's relevant to um, somebody somewhere else around the world. I, I don't think that's necessarily true. I think the novelty in the science and novelty in the engineering, uh, contribution is what really matters. And hopefully that'll come through. Um, but I think that the tendency is that the center of mass for ERI is, is domestic in the U S and so the tendency will be that more reviewers will be domestic. Um, but I, I personally try to get, um, reviewers that are not only distributed um, in all sorts of ways, but also have the expertise on the topic at hand, which typically means they're they're either in country or aware of the region that that the study is being uh, promoted for. So it's a good question, a tough one. 
Let's see. I, if, in final, I love to read Earthquake Spectre new articles every Thursday because it covers multidisciplinary topics in their domain. Thanks for conducting the seminar and clearing all, all, all doubts. Well, thank you very much. That's a that's a wonderful comment. And um, I wish I had Thursdays free. Yeah. Um, I love reading. I love seeing the papers come in. And I love, you know, it's really some great stuff that comes through Earthquake Spectre. And so um, it Join up and, and contribute through reviews and, and ultimately being an associate editor and, and you'll get to participate more. Great. Thank you. Uh, last question. What did what do you do if reviewers are taking too much time for the review and emails, the editor are also not replied? Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's there's always a challenge. We always kind of joke that the third reviewer is always the slowest. Um, you know, we we do. Um, we do have lots of options when there's slow reviews. One of them is if the two reviews that come in uh, are consistent in their in their requirements and they're sufficient, we can we cannot wait for the third review. That that happens quite a bit, um, at least if they're saying exactly the same thing uh, and the recommendations are similar. Uh, we've also d do a couple other things. One is to uh, go to another reviewer and kind of insist that that be done very quickly, uh, that's done. And a lot of the time, the AE will provide a, a review if they're a subject matter expert. And often they are because we picked the AE for that particular purpose. Um, and and the, uh, apologies ahead of time, but when when a reviewer does not respond and, and doesn't um, doesn't really uh, say why or, or say they're, they're coming soon, um, going to a new reviewer is sort of like starting the clock over. And uh, sometimes it's absolutely necessary because the, the current reviews are insufficient for rendering a, a proper decision. So that's, that's the, the, you know, the kind of um, curse of peer review is that you are, <laughs> you are beholden to your peers and, and um, everyone is doing it in a voluntary way. And, and, and everyone has all, everyone that's good is got other obligations and that's, that's the challenge. Um, but I, I again send the editor send send me a, a note and we'll make sure that um, we follow up uh, directly with you because uh, we don't like we don't like papers to bog down in the system. We'd like to see them go through. What what it, it makes me wonder with that question? So that there was a kind of a general question about what if the editor is not responding? It makes me suspect that experience is with a different journal because I know um, David is quite responsive and. People come in, and I, I am as well. Even if the response is simply to say, hey, "We're trying," I know we're a little stuck here, but um, you know, we're gonna we're gonna make another push to get this done. Like, I'll at least acknowledge that there's a a delay. If you're really getting no response at all, um, I suspect it's from somebody else. And and it is fair to notice that not all journals are equal in this. And some some journals really prioritize speed. Um, maybe um, even at the expense of kind of rigorous review. Some journals really um, are not as worried about the speed. And if you get to a situation where um, you know, I've, I've been on this in the situation myself that a reviewer or the journal hasn't been responsive or the reviews don't seem fair and the, the editor is not willing to step in and kind of adjudicate and, and get to a decision. You know, take your work elsewhere next time. I know it's frustrating in the moment there, but you're the you're the product ultimately. And if the journal is not kind of being responsive enough to get to a good outcome, um, then, you know, take your work elsewhere. I certainly keep track of places where I've had bad experiences and I don't go back there again. I know that's a hard hard thing to learn until it's after the fact, but you know we, we're we know we're competing for the best work, and we're going to aim to do a good job so that the best work makes its way to our journal. And if it was earthquake spectra, Jack and I both get very embarrassed by these kinds of things. They could slow down, and we jump on them right away. So send us a note. Um, and if it's if it's one of us, or if it if you want to get an independent perspective, send it either to Spectra at ERI, which is our managing editor, or uh, Farzad Naim, as 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 Jack pointed to. Okay, let's take a little, one last question because it's in there. Can a PhD postdoc student participate in volunteer and reviewing? Absolutely. Um, we tend to see uh, all sorts of talented people at, at every stage in their career. And typically what will happen is, you know, you won't be alone. You'll have two other reviewers that are contributing to that particular paper. And when I'm doing this kind of work, I'll pick somebody new and excited to in the field as well as some senior and um and other uh you know widely distributed um, talents to try to get a, a balanced review but absolutely okay back to elizabeth all right um thank you all again for attending and thank you particularly to to jack and david for such a great and informative presentation. Uh, I hope this brings many more exciting papers into Spectra in the future.
Um, for those of you attended, you'll be seeing a web a post webinar survey pop up in your browser afterwards if you're still here, or you'll receive it by email tomorrow. Um, so please fill that out. It's really helpful for us to get your feedback on these events and learn what you want to hear about in the future so we can make sure our programming uh, meets the interests of our audience. As noted before, you can learn more about ERI and join us at those links, and you can find out about upcoming webinars through our Pulse newsletter. And then finally, I just want to say uh, to thank FEMA and ERI members like yourselves uh, for the support that makes doing events like this possible and also makes uh, publications like Earthquake Spectra possible. So thank you and have a great day. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thanks, Jack. Thank you.